Good morning and welcome to worship at First Baptist Church. It is great to be here on this beautiful Sunday morning and uh, I hope that you are already uh, feeling the spirit of the Lord in this place um, as we gather to worship God and to praise His holy name. Um, I want to welcome those who might be visiting us this morning. I see some faces that I don't recognize, so we welcome you and hope that you feel um, at, at ease here and welcome. If you need anything at any time, we have some ushers who are in the back section of the vestibule. They can point you in any direction you might need to go. Um, additionally, if you're visiting, please note that a portion of the bulletin does tear out. You can put contact information there and leave it in an offering plate following the service. And we will, um, uh, this coming week, reach out to you and see how we might be able to minister to you and to your family. I want to say a word of welcome to those who are joining us online as well. We always welcome your presence. And uh, as I do each Sunday, would like to encourage you to say hello in the comment section to get a sense of the community uh, that is gathered online. Uh, remember that for giving of tithes and offerings, you can do so following the service using the offering plates that are located on the sides of the stage and also in the vestibule. Additionally, you can give online at firstbaptistfarmville.org. There's a link at the top of the page that is active. Um, also, you can give um, by mailing uh, tithes and offerings or dropping them off to the office during the week. Um, as you notice, I have a jacked up right eye, okay? So... I'm sorry, and if you can't see it, um, it's, it's tearing, and, uh, and I'm sorry. Uh, yesterday, the pink eye came upon me, and um, I started some drops immediately, and it, I've been 18 hours under anti-antibiotic drops, okay, but I'm probably still not to the, 20, I'm not to the 24-hour deal, so look, I've been, I have my hand sanitizer with me, okay? I've been hand, hand sanitizing a whole lot. I have touched this area, so Holly and Beth, when you come, just stand, keep your stuff in the air. I have touched the drums, so don't let anybody touch the drums at the end of the service. And I have not touched the guitar yet, but I am after my sermon, so don't touch the guitar or the microphone, okay? We'll keep everybody germ-free, okay? All right, all right. Now we can talk about the announcements, and you can be okay with... I'm not in like a secret fight club or something y'all don't know about. All right, so announcements-wise, we have the kids' pool party this afternoon from 3 to 6 at Carl and Julia Bonner's. Um, if you need any information about that, please see Holly. Also on our schedule um, is a children's beach retreat next week, August 4th through the 6th. Any questions you have about that, please see Holly. Um, also, uh, it's canceled? Okay. Um, also, uh, Youth Sunday is next Sunday, August the 6th. And on that day, we're going to begin the service with a bunch of baptisms. And so it's going to be a day to celebrate. I hope that you're excited about next Sunday um, as our youth come and they uh, report on uh, what their camp experience was like. You've heard a lot about it through uh, my sermons and also from Zach last week. And so there's a lot to celebrate uh, with regards to our youth ministry next Sunday. And so I hope you'll, you'll come and be part of that. Also, Luke Garner um, is having his fundraiser for his Eagle Scout uh, project following the service, and that's a barbecue fundraiser. Plates are ten dollars each, and of course, they take uh, any donate any amount of donations. Um, he is working or alongside of Linda, and they are um, uh, installing uh, uh, a walkway for children with autism and other other handicaps at the municipal um, playground in Farmville. Um, and there's like a sensory board as part of that, and some some different things. So it's a pretty neat uh, project and opportunity for us to uh, come around him and support him. Um, I do want to say a word of thank you to uh, the refuge servers and meal providers this past week. We had a handful of folks 
couple handfuls of folks actually uh, uh, be part of that ministry to the refuge and um, it, it is very appreciated um, by our church, of course, by the refuge folks. And Elaine wanted me to make sure um, that, that uh, she knows how thankful she is for your support of that ministry. I think that's it. So at this time, I would like to invite you to join your hearts uh, with me in prayer. God, we give you thanks for all things. We give you thanks for this day of worship. Um, God, as we uh, seek you with all of our hearts, we pray uh, that you enjoy uh, receiving uh, our love and our worship and our praise of you. You are absolutely worthy, worthy of it. And God, we also pray that during this time of worship that you would calm our minds, our busy minds, and help us be present in this place. And uh, as we give you what you deserve, it, it, it's good and fitting for our souls, and it helps us uh, realign our priorities and our, our hearts and our minds. And so uh, we pray that we would feel peace coming into our lives, joy coming into our lives, and that we are surrounded uh, with your love and with the love of this community of faith. We give you thanks for our family of faith and that we can come together in this beautiful place to worship you this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray and in Jesus' name we worship. Amen. Good morning. morning. This morning I will be reading from Psalm 67. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us so that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you rule the peoples with equity and guide the nations of the earth. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. The land yields its harvest. God, our God, blesses us. May God bless us still so that all the ends of the earth will fear him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You to stand as we sing the song of praise you say.
As we go now into a time of prayer, I want to direct you to the back of the bulletin where our prayer list is. And um, I have a couple of updates here. Uh, most of you know Cedric is uh, in the ho- Cedric Davis is in the hospital. And I talked to, Sh- to Shirley and Mary George this morning, and, and they have been dealing with COVID. Thankfully, they are at a position now they're um, not quarantined, and they're able to go and be with Cedric at the hospital. But uh, they asked prayer for him. Um, he does have pneumonia. They're treating him for that. Um, he's not eating well, and so um, uh, there are several hurdles to overcome. And so um, y'all know he's been through a lot. They've been through a whole lot, and so they just uh, so appreciate the prayers of our congregation and church family uh, for them during this time. And um, and I assured them this mor- this morning that I would share this with you all, and we will be praying. I also wanted to um, to ask prayer for Ann Walters. Um, most of y'all probably know her in the community. Um, Ann Walters is Randy Walters' wife and Hunter Walters' mom, and I think there is a another brother maybe. I don't know the rest of the family, but I know Hunter Walters, um, and uh, she had a stroke. Ann had a stroke this past week, and she's in the hospital. She's showing some improvement, um, uh, and, but there still has a long ways to go, and so I assured him I would share this uh, prayer need this morning with our church family that we would be lifting Ann, Randy, and, and their family up in prayer. So um, as, we, as we do during this time, we're going to have a, a time where uh, some music is playing, and we have a, a chance where we're sitting to, to lift up these um, who are on our prayer list and, and uh, also those who we might carry in our hearts who are going through uh, various things um, to, to to the Lord, and then I will close with the pastoral prayer. So let us pray. God, we thank you that you hear our prayers and our cries and our pleas for help and for your movement um, in our lives and in the lives of others. God, we love our family of faith and those who are part of it and those who are in our extended family and and in our community. And uh, God, we lift up uh, these folks to you today. We pray for Jean, for Alex, for Cedric and Shirley, for Bobby, Bob and Christine. Van and Diane, for Candace, for George, for Missy, Donald, for Lou and their family, for David, Jackie, Kevin, Henry, Edith, David, Brian, and Holly, and for Ann. Lord, we lift these up to you. We know there's so many others that we carry with us in our hearts and minds and that we're praying for. Uh, God, we know that we live in a world that is broken where disease exists, and it's hard sometimes. Um, God, we do pray that that you would heal, and we pray for healing, for earthly healing. But God, we give thanks that that sometimes the healing we experience is eternal healing, um, being ushered into your presence. And God, it's hard for us on earth to understand or to, to think about that and long for that because we do love this earth so much, and we love the people that we're around. Uh, but God, in your scriptures, you're pretty clear that if we put our faith in Jesus, that We are heirs, co-heirs with Christ uh, of all your promises, uh, of eternity with you in peace, in health, in a place where all of those broken things don't exist anymore. And so, God, we thank you for that. God, we do pray for our brothers and sisters who are battling and who are dealing with various things. We pray that you would give them courage in the midst of their battles, that you would show, show us how we can be your hands and feet and give encouragement Uh, to them and walk side by side with them. We pray for those in our church who are uh, continuing to go through a journey with grief, having lost loved ones in the past uh, months, year, and years. God, we pray that you would continue to bring healing to their hearts and to their minds and that you would 
uh, envelop them in, in, in the love of this family of faith and bring comfort and peace in those ways. So we pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. Now I want to invite you to stand again as we sing our song of worship, Jesus at the Center.
Good morning. This morning, our Old Testament reading is coming from 1 Kings 3, 5 through 12. That night, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream, and God said, What do you want? Ask, and I will give it to you. Solomon replied, You showed great and faithful love to your servant, my father David, because he was honest and true and faithful to you. And you have continued to show this great and faithful love to him today by giving him a son to sit on his throne. Now, O Lord, my God, you have made me king instead of my father David, but I am like a little child who doesn't know his way around. And here I am in the midst of your own chosen people, a nation so great and numerous they cannot be counted. Give me an understanding heart so that I can govern your people well and know the difference between right and wrong. For who by himself is able to govern this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased with Solomon, with, was pleased that Solomon had asked for wisdom. So God replied, Because you have asked for wisdom in governing my people with justice and have not asked for a long life or wealth or the death of your enemies, I will give you what you asked for. I will give you a wise and understanding heart, such as one no one else has had or ever will have. This is the word of the, God, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, can I have all my kids come down? Look at this row. This is awesome. How are you guys doing this morning? Good. You look great. I'm glad you're all here. Are y'all glad to be here? Are you sure, Kenna? You promise you're good? Okay. Kenna's like, I got a smile out of it today. All right. So we're going to talk about something a little, well, for my boys, it may be a little fun. Have y'all ever wrestled? Yeah, that was Joanna. You, I, I know you have. You've wrestled when you were five. You wrestle your dog all the time. Perfect, Jennings. Your brother. I can see it. I did too when we were little. My brother. You wrestle your brother. So y'all, y'all know what wrestling is. Then, how many times have you gotten hurt? <laughs> Looks like, huh? Thousands, millions, a million times. Yeah, you get hurt because you're roughhousing, you're playing. How many times is it just for play, or how many times is it because you're upset about something? Uh, mostly it's people that I can upset about something? Uh, just play? Okay. And, pl- and hard. Just play, though? Luke was like, yeah, it's because I'm upset. So thank you for being honest. I appreciate it. The one thing that we do, wrestling can be fun if it's in play. When you're upset, not necessarily how you want to handle that. Because people get hurt because you use a little bit harder. Huh? Mm -hmm. Cool down a little bit first. A lot of times we like to wrestle with God. God will say, okay, I need you to go do this, or this is what I want you to do. And you're like, nope, not going to do it. Not going to do it. Not comfortable at all. Or you just, you're you wrestling with the decision God's telling you to go do. You, right, absolutely, Joanna. The easiest thing to do is just do what God's telling you to do rather than disobey God. Absolutely. That is perfect. Because, yeah, we should absolutely just go ahead and say, yes, God. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do it. I don't want to do it, but I am. Absolutely. That's how we respond a lot of times. And so we go, nope, not going to do it. You know, when God's calling you, and y'all are a little young, you may not know what God's calling you to do quite yet, but it'll come a time when he does. 
Like there was a time when he first called me into youth ministry back at Memorial at my other church. When he first made that call to me that I was supposed to go into ministry, I was like, have you lost your mind? What do I know about ministry? I'd not been to seminary. He did. He told me it was time for me to step into ministry. And I thought he was crazy. And it would, took me a while. I wrestled with him. I was like, I don't think this is the right path. I can teach a class. You know, I can be responsible for one little section. I don't want to be responsible for the whole. And he's like, nope, this is where you're going. And it took me a bit. And then I ended up as a summer intern training under the youth minister there for a summer. And that led to another summer internship. And that led to me leading the youth ministry eventually. And then that led to me being here. God can do amazing things. He does. But we have to listen and say yes and stop wrestling with God. Because he knows best. And it'll be the biggest blessing you've ever had. So remember that. When God tells you to do something, like Joanna said, it's better just to do it than disobey him. Because he's going to be blessed. You are going to be blessed. Let's pray. Creator God, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to serve you, for calling us into your works. Help us to have the courage to stand up and say yes and say, send me. Help us to remember that you know what's best and that you are blessing us each and every day. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
congregation. I would like to encourage you all to say hello to the folks around you. When the music slows down and comes to a stop, that's a sign to the sermon's about to begin. As you're finding your seats, I'll share with you this past week, Luke got a blow dart gun. And uh, there's about three squirrels running around Farmville with darts in their hips. And uh, it's always, always an adventure in the Byram household. One other family thing, and then we'll jump into the sermon. On one Wednesday night we were here, me and Levi, because Luke and Gina were in Snow Hill. He had his last baseball practice before the tournament started on, on Thursday. And, and, you know, the, the group was feeding the refuge. We had over 100 kids and the adults here that were being fed and lots of energy, wonderful time. And, of course, Levi being true to himself, he wanted to be in the nursery with all that excitement going on. So we were kind of popping in and out. And uh, at the end, uh, all the adults and we were invited to participate were eating what was basically left over, right? That's what you do when you're serving like that. 
And all that was left over was chicken wings. And so we're sitting there eating chicken wings and Levi's devouring his. And all of a sudden he goes, mmm, this is good, just like squirrel. <laughs> got, some, got a few looks, you know, but anyway. You know, life is tough sometimes, isn't it? Yeah. Sometimes it's enough to knock us off of our feet. I was reminded this past week, as Gina and I were thinking about how this past year has gone, uh, that last, last Monday was the anniversary uh, of a series of unfortunate events that took place in our lives. It, it was so bad that after a couple months, I started making a list of all the things that were going wrong so I could pray for them and make sure I'm covering them all in prayer. And, and uh, I don't still have that list, uh, thankfully. I, I, I think one day I just uh, gave it to the Lord and tore it and threw it away and said He's got all of these things in, under control. But, and, and as I share this, I want to just make sure you know I'm not complaining. I'm what? Someone said it. Explaining, okay? Not complaining, explaining. Life sometimes comes at you. A year ago, uh, we, were on, uh, we were on our vacation to the beach on Saturday evening, the last night of our vacation. Had had a wonderful time. Rick was down there and his family at the same time, and so we got to see them a whole lot, catch a lot of fish. Um, and that, that evening, about 9 o'clock, our littlest dog, Layla, got into some chewing gum. And then we found out chewing gum has xylitol in it. Is that, that's, where's Julia at? Yeah, that's the right thing, right? They, they were not so getting on the phone with uh, Julie, who's not only a wonderful singer here, and, and, and she and Carl are uh, deacons here, but also she's our vet uh, for our dogs. And so get on the phone with her. Of course, it's not good. It's toxic. We're freaking out a little bit. In the middle of us freaking out over Layla getting this, we realize she pees right in the middle of the bed. So then we're changing sheets and have to wash these things. And thankfully, we got it quick enough that it didn't get into the mattress. The next morning, we were... Packing in a hurry, trying to get out of there, because they, they want you out of those rentals pretty quick, you know. And so we got out, got back to Farmville, got here just in time to realize that we had left, we had put, a, you know, the white trash bags, had filled one with dirty clothes, and had left it laying near the white sheets that were all in a pile. It all looked together, it all camouflaged together. And so we, we, we ended up being able to, but it took a lot of effort being able to recover our, our laundry that was left. Then I had my hernia surgery, uh, which, which had been planned, but it wasn't enjoyable. Then uh, Gina had that stomach bug that became a very, very long health struggle that is uh, still not fixed. Um, uh, then our dogs got into a rotisserie chicken. So they ate all the bones, okay? Ate all the bones. So I'm getting on the phone with, with Julia again. Then our plumbing backed up several times into the, into the house, requiring a lot of money and to, to, to rip our uh, whole front yard, all that great. But thankfully, we got a good plumber. And uh, then the dogs ate another rotisserie chicken a couple weeks later. Then the hawks killed all my pigeons. Then our plumbing went bad again. And this time, it, it was... It was it, we had a lot of people look at it, and, and it was, we finally got it fixed. Then the AC, it was because it was still warm late last year, then the AC went out. Then my mom found out she had breast cancer. And then probably another rotisserie chicken got eaten. I don't know if you're keeping count, Julie, but we've talked to you a lot about these rotisserie chickens, such that she's, you know, she, she makes sure we don't buy those anymore. Um, again, it could have been so much worse. And, I, and I'm not trying to complain, but I want to explain that sometimes life comes at us fast, doesn't it? Sometimes it knocks us off our feet. Maybe it's a diagnosis, a diagnosis that comes with a date. Maybe it's an accident that no one could have expected. And that accident uh, uh, changes the, your life and alters a family's life forever. Maybe there are financial situations that occur that Cause you to question the future that you had planned. Maybe there's relational conflict that changes dynamics of you and another person or maybe within your family. Or maybe it's sin that you have committed or someone has committed against you and there are consequences. In fact, where we're going to look today is in Romans uh, chapter 8. And Paul has just uh, gotten done. I've, I, this comes after those couple of sermons that I preached back in, in earlier uh, July, the sermon called The Struggle Against Sin, and then the, the one the next week that was titled Who Governs Your Mind. In those two sermons, we looked at Paul and his words about the f living life by the flesh and by the Spirit, and 
in, in the law, and you know, the law is a reflection of your sinfulness, but also a roadmap to righteousness. But we are called to live life by the Spirit, anchoring ourselves into following Jesus with our lives and living like that, allowing Him to govern our mind. And so I wonder if Paul was in a hard time because of the sin in his life. You know, he talked about, he said, I can't, I, I can't do what I want to do, and I do what I don't want to do. And he, he, he talks about those, those things. Again, life comes at us fast. Life causes us to move toward rock bottom. Some, tell somebody, tell your neighbor real quick, life causes us to move toward rock bottom. I know that's a, I know that's a mouthful. Life causes us to move toward rock bottom. But now tell them, there's good news. There's, good, there's always good news in the family of God, right? Jesus always brings good news. Jesus brought hard questions to people, didn't He? I mean, He, he challenged His disciples, but it was always for their good. There, it's all, there's always good news. The, the, the word gospel uh, means good news. So this morning I want us to look at some good news. In Romans chapter 8, uh, verse 26 through 39. And you might not be going through a battle in your life and a hard time in your life, and it might not feel like you've hit rock bottom in any way. So maybe you need to hear this this morning and file it away for later. Because sometimes these things happen. Sometimes there are chains of, event that happen, of events that happen in our lives that we need to go back to the Scriptures and remind ourselves that that, that, that is not God's news to us. God's news is always... Good news. There are things we need to remember. The first thing we need to remember when we hit rock bottom is that God hears our groaning. He hears our groans. I've told you before that when stuff starts happening, it's, my, it's, it's the fleshly reaction to go, ah, this again. I mean, like literally, like yesterday, we're driving to go return a, a fish. that. So we got two sharks. I, I hadn't planned on talking about this, but earlier in the week, Gina called me. Okay, I'm here working. She's like, we're at the Pet Supply Plus. I'm like, oh, no. And then she goes, Luke wants to get a fish again. I'm like, oh, no. So end up, I, they got the fish. They got two fish, and they're shark fish. Well, they didn't tell us that they don't like each other. So the first one mysteriously died. So we took the shark fish that died back, brought the new one back, and then it was just like, bah, bah, I mean, just fighting, nailing the size of each other. And then we called again and talked to a fish specialist. And apparently these fish do not... They don't, they don't live well together, you know. So they, anyway, we end up having to take them back again. But in, in the midst of one of these trips, I'm like, my eye hurts, Gina. And by, the, by like an hour later, there was stuff coming out. I'm like, we just got through pink eye. They went through the family twice, two months ago. Not again. Ugh. I was ready to groan. You, are you like that? Something starts happening. Ugh. The plumbing goes out again. Ugh. The AC goes on. Ugh. This is, what, this is what Paul says in, in the midst of uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 26 and 27. He says, in the same way, the Spirit, remember we've got to allow the Holy Spirit to govern our minds and to lead us to Jesus. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for. You ever been there before? You ever had so many things to pray about you don't know where to start? We don't know what we ought to pray for. Well, how about this? I remember going through counseling uh, classes in, in, uh, in seminary, and, and the professor said, he said, I, he said, I've never been through depression he said, or early in his ministry. He said, but people would come and talk about being in a depression, and when they pray, that it felt like their prayers couldn't even get through the ceiling. He said, and I didn't know what that was like until I went through a depression of my own. I've, I've in, in, in my journey, in, in my time in ministry, there have been some tough times, and, and I know exactly what that feels like as well. Early on in my ministry, I, I came across this scripture right after this professor had taught us about that. And so I, I preach to myself, and I remind myself when life gets hard that God hears my groans. God hears the groaning. He, he knows what's in my heart. I might not know what I ought to pray for or where to begin, or even how to go about it. But he says here, the Spirit Himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. I've been asked before, what's it like to pray without ceasing? 
And I don't think it's just sitting down for 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, and having your eyes closed and your hands folded and talking to God. But it's developing this spirit and this attitude that is towards God. I'll, I'll be going through things like dri- just driving down the road and thinking about stuff, but there's like I, I feel this groaning coming up, and I'm like, what is that? And so I, I start talking to the Lord about it, and then I realize that, that there's maybe something that someone said to me a week ago, that all, and I didn't, I didn't hear it at the time. I didn't, I, I didn't, you know, I didn't interpret what they were going through at the time. They made a comment, but all of a sudden it hits me again, and I start praying for that person. And then I see them again, and I, and I, and I ask them just a, just a simple question about what's going on. I realize they've been going through something, and the Spirit in me knew that. The Holy Spirit knew that and wanted to prompt me to be praying about that. That's why Paul says that it's a mystery, right? Faith isn't cut and dry, black and white. But there's a mystery that we live in, a a, a relationship with the Lord, and especially with the Spirit. The early Christians uh, used the word pneuma for the Spirit. Pneuma means breath. We can't see our breath, but we trust it's there. Amen? Everybody take a breath. Pneuma, the Holy Spirit. So he who searches our heart knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. I hope that it's encouraging this morning for you to know there's a Spirit that God has placed in you, that dwells in you, that is always working for our good, we'll see in a second, but, all, but, but, but is interceding on behalf of the Father, that is working with our soul, with our spirit, in ways that we might not even fully comprehend or understand, but it's for our goodness within the will of God. Of God. That's why it's so important that we put faith in Jesus. That we not just say, okay, well, I, I think it's a good idea, and then one day I'm going to really just really put my faith in Jesus, you know, right before uh, you know, I die or when I'm older or when I can get real serious about it. But as soon as we hear the gospel, like Philip and the Ethiopian, you know, what, should, what, what should hold us back from accepting Jesus? From making a public profession of faith? from being baptized in the waters that are a powerful symbol. Because the Scriptures say when we put our faith in Jesus, and it's not in the water, when we put our faith in Jesus, His Spirit dwells in us. The power power of that Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in us. And so I, I want you to tell somebody this morning, God hears your groans. Tell your neighbor, God hears your groans. Secondly, God is working for our good. And we know that in all things, someone say all things. Okay, I don't know the Greek phrase for all things, but it means all things. Okay? All right, I can go look it up in my my Bible software, but I'm I'm pretty sure it means everything. There's not a thing that we go through that, that that might seem trivial to us in the moment, or it might seem that it has so much power over us on that day that God isn't still working for the good in the midst of it. We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. And then he gets into some stuff that we can spend a lot of time talking about. And I want to read it, then do a little explaining. I've explained it before. Uh, But in verse 29, For those God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters, And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. All right, so we we enter into... I'm not one who likes to jump over verses, okay? I could have easily done that today just to to avoid these, but it's important that that we speak about some things, about all things. Uh, But when we speak about these things, uh, about the word predestination and what that means, there are a couple of lines of thought. And, and one line of thought that I've encountered in my time in being a Christian and being a ministry is that God creates people to be bad and to be good. Okay? It, it creates some who are going to be saved and creates some who are going to have a miserable existence on the earth and go to hell. Okay? And I, I get that Paul and some of the other uh, writers in the Scriptures are trying to grapple and, and grasp some things that, again, are a mystery. Okay, it, it's hard when we imagine, you know, when we try to put ourselves in the shoes of God. God can exist outside of the timeline that we exist on. Okay, so today is July 30th at 1125 and 24 seconds a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Okay, I can't go back to, uh, to 1115. 
All right, I'm going to go forward to 11.35. God knows what's going to happen at 11.35. God knows if I'm going to still be preaching or if I'm going to have arrived already. Okay? God, God, God knows all this, but I don't know all those things. But God is able to see on all sides of the timeline. Okay? So some people will say, well, God creates people and He's going to make them for hell. But the other side of that is that, well, actually, God knows the choices that people are already going to make. So I, I was wrestling with these things, and I knew some other people who were wrestling with these things at a church that I previously served, um, who, who were very conservative when it came to Scripture and to doctrine, and we were, we, we were having great conversations about these things. And he said, Graham, this is the way that, 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 I've, that I've wrestled with this Scripture, like Holly shared this morning, we wrestled with this Scripture, because we can wrestle with the Scriptures and allow them to teach us and allow us to understand them. He said, this is the way I see it. He said, I have, I have a, a son and a daughter. When my son and daughter were, were growing up, he said, I had, I had wishes for them. I had wishes that they would walk into the faith. You know, that they would put their faith and trust in Jesus. I, I saw the things that they were good at, and, and I would hope that my son would go into some sort of construction or, or such. I, I know my daughter had a very, a very bright mind, and I was hoping she would go into some higher studies and maybe be a professor or something like that. He said, so I tried to encourage them in those things, but I couldn't make their decisions. He said, he said so predestination is like that. He said, I believe, and, and I believe the same thing. I believe that God has not created a single person who doesn't have a purpose within, with, within the world, within the kingdom of God, and for God's, God's gospel and, and good purposes, to be able to share that within their lives. However, sin is prevalent in our world. And when a person walks that path, God already knows where they're going to go. God already knows the direction that their life is going to go, what the path is on. Does that make sense? But I still believe that God gives free will to us to walk the path, to journey the path. So let me tell you this morning, if you have chosen the path of God, and we, if you want to have some conversation about it, we can have some more conversation. I love talking about these things, okay? I, I believe God is a good and gracious and loving Father and wants the best for every person He's put a soul into. He, 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 the, the Scripture says He yearns jealously over people, wanting, wanting them to accept him as their Savior, accept Jesus as their Savior, be gifted the Holy Spirit, that God yearns jealously over the ones He has created. But let me tell you this this morning. When you hit rock bottom and you love Jesus and you're following Jesus, you might not be perfect and there might be some sin that caused you to hit rock bottom, but remember that God, if you're following God, He's always working for your good. Okay? I've, I've, I have had so many conversations with people who think that their past keeps them from having anything good in their future. Yet there's consequences, right? You break a law, there's consequences. In the law of the land, there's consequences. But within the family of God, God is quick to forgive. God is quick to restore. The, the story of the prodigal son. Tell somebody, God's working for your good. Tell your neighbor, we've got to preach this to one another. God's working for your good. Third, God, God is for us and nothing and no one compares. God is for us and there's nothing and no one who can overshadow what God has that is good for us. Alright, this is what Paul goes on to write. He says in, in verse 11, What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? It's not even close. When God is for us, it's not even close. Nothing can stand even, even close. I have a friend who's a minister, a pastor up in the, um, in, uh, the mountain area, and, and he told analogy, this analogy one time about God's goodness and how it doesn't compare. He said, you know, there was, he, he was teaching, he was, he was coaching T-ball. And he had little kids um, get into two little teams at the end of practice. And they started at home plate, and they had to throw the ball as far as they could. He said, and they were practicing on a really big baseball field, so the fence was way out there. So they divided up in two teams, but it was not even. It was like six versus five. And so the kids noticed that. The kids said, Mr. Jason, we need you to be on our team. So it became six versus six, but there was a coach on one team. So he says they, they each threw the ball, and they get out there, and by the time you know, five of the kids had thrown the ball, they were about in the middle of the outfield. The next kid throws it and rolls up towards where the warning track is. 
And so Jason said he had a decision to make. Was he going to barely get it there, or was he going to launch it? And so what he did was rare, and he was a college baseball player. He rare back, and he threw it deep into the trees. And his kids celebrated. And, and, and he said that's, that's the analogy of when God is for us. It's not like God just barely gets us past the finish line. No, no. We, it's, like, it's like Zach preached last week and, and, and used that line that our uh, camp pastor did. He, he said, we're not fighting for victory. We, we already fight from victory when we're fighting with the Lord. So hear that this morning. You might think your situation's too big for God or bigger than God, but nothing comes close. And that's what Paul says here. If God is for us, who can be against us? Then, then, then he goes into what Jesus is doing in this whole mix. He says, um, sorry, I can't see now. Um, verse 33, who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. You know, when we talk about God the Father, we talk about the wrath of God against sin. And the theological understanding uh, that, that we have of uh, people, when, the, when, we, you know, when we're born, uh, we're born broken, um, we're born sinful, you know, I mean, but we're also born with potential and with purpose. Um, and if, we, if we're outside of relationship with Christ, the, the, the doctrinally and theologically, our standing before God is that we deserve the wrath of God for the sins that we've committed. It doesn't matter if, if we tally them up and it's 1,001, or one. We deserve the wrath for that. And so us accepting Jesus, then Jesus covers us. And so uh, the, the, the early understanding was that Jesus was at the right hand of God in heaven, interceding for us on our behalf, speaking. Our, that's why when we pray, we pray in the name of Jesus. We're taught in the scriptures to pray in the name of Jesus. But also when God looks down at us, he doesn't see us in our sinful state. God is, it's like Jesus is there covering our sin with his hand. And God is like, who is that? And Jesus is like, they're ours. They're ours. He's ours. She's ours. God is interceding for Jesus continually covers our sin and intercedes for us. Remind, remind yourself of that. And then number five, the last thing I want to say is that nothing, nothing separates us from God's love that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. When you hit rock bottom in your life, that thing can't separate you from the love of God. Paul writes, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble? No. Hardship? Persecution? Famine? Nakedness? Danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face these things. We face death all day long. And we are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. He's, Paul's saying, is that true? Do these things separate us from the love of God? Huh? Last year when we were going when we were going through all those things, I never never once thought, oh man, this is going to separate me from the love of God. But there's been things in my life that have been tough, and I've wondered, what is this going to do to my relationship with God? When I lost my dad, that was, that was one of those times. I remember thinking, man, is, it, is this going to is this going to break that fracture that relationship? Thankfully, God surrounded me in His love. Paul answers to this, no. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's absolutely nothing, no situation, no amount of sin that separates us from the love of God. I spend a lot of time trying to remind people of that. A lot of time. Because the devil wants to whisper to us as soon as we mess up, as soon as we sin, as soon as that hardship comes, I'm stronger. God's weaker. You're hated. You're despised. Everybody knows. They're not going to love you again. That's not God's voice, is it? God's voice is, no, you're, you're a child of mine. You're a saint. You're not a sinner. 
You are loved. Let me restore you. You know, the, the truth is, for the Christian, the one who's put their trust in Jesus, that Jesus is our Savior and our Lord, those are big things. A lot of people want a Savior, but few realize that when you get a Savior, you're also supposed to have a Lord, one that you trust, one you obey, one that is continually trying to work for your good, but you've got to listen, right? For the Christian who's put their trust in Jesus, rock bottom doesn't exist. The further down you go, you realize you're actually on a firm foundation. Right? God hears your groans. He's working for your good. There's nothing that can compare to Him. Jesus is covering your sin. He's interceding for you. He's speaking to God the Father. There's nothing that is going to keep you from the love of God. The Scripture says it this way. Just so you know, I'm not ending the, ending the sermon here just on telling you. I want to prove it to you as well. Let's see in the Scriptures. Isaiah 28, 16 says, So this is what the Sovereign Lord says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone for a sure foundation. The one who relies on it will never be stricken with panic. Then in Matthew 7, Jesus says these words, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears the words of mine and put, does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10 through 11, Paul writes to the church in, in Corinth, By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If your foundation is anything else, it is rock bottom. Oh me. All right? That's why we got to, that, that, that's, that's why it's so, it's so important that we seek God in the Scriptures and that we develop that relationship. Because if, if we're not, if we don't have that relationship and we're not, we, we, we don't have faith in Christ, yeah, rock bottom exists and it keeps getting worse and worse and worse. No one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus, Paul says. And then lastly, in Ephesians 2, 19-22, he says, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers. But you are fellow citizens with God's people and also members of His household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, with Jesus Christ Himself as the chief cornerstone. In Him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple. And in Him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by His Spirit. I don't know who needed to hear the word uh, this morning. But tell somebody real quick, we have a firm foundation. Tell somebody, tell somebody real quick, we have a firm foundation. As we close this morning, I want to share a song, and uh, I didn't get a chance to practice it because I didn't want to get the cooties on the guitar. So Daniel, you're welcome. Y'all got a big week coming up, so I didn't want to mess that up. So, um, this song is called Firm Foundation, and it's one that was sung at camp, and the youth are going to sing it next week. Um, during, uh, it's going to come right after we do the baptisms. And uh, it, really, it really was like a, it was a moving song for our youth and for the chaperones at camp. Uh, just a reminder that if we are in Christ, we are, we are on a firm foundation already. And... Uh, I hope that uh, I have written in the bulletin, this is a meditative response. So the words will be on the screen. Um, and if you want to sing, if you know this song, if you've heard it on the radio before, um, I invite you to sing, but I'm going to ask you to stay seated uh, for this song. And um, obviously, we're not going to have a, a, uh, an altar call this morning, because I, again, don't want to infect anybody with this. But um, I do want to remind you that, you know, that God's always working in all of our lives. And, uh, and I'm here for you as your pastor um, with whatever you need. So don't hesitate to reach out to me probably after another 24 hours being on the drops. And we'll, 
we'll spend some time together, or we can talk on the phone or text. Um, I'm thankful for you all, and, and I'm thankful for uh, what God is doing in all of our lives. But I know the devil wants to whisper to us that we don't have a firm foundation. We don't have a place to stand. When, 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 the, when, when the rain comes, the winds blow, and the seas rise, we're going to be swept away, but that is not true. So, um, As we worship uh, and join our hearts with this song, um, let's, uh, let's proclaim these words that Christ is our firm foundation. Christ is my firm foundation The rock on which I stand When everything around me is shaking I've never been more glad That I put my faith in Jesus Cause He's never let me down He's faithful through generations So why would He fail now? He won't I've still got joy in chaos I've got peace that makes no sense So I won't be going under I'm not held by my own strength Cause I build my life on Jesus He's never let me down He's faithful in me
you thanks that you're our firm foundation. We give you thanks that you are at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. We thank you that uh, when life gets tough, when hardships come, when there are things that are happening out of our control, or maybe we've made a mess of the thing, that you, you want us to turn and, and, and run to you. You want us to have intimacy with you. That is how we are restored. And so, uh, God, we thank you that you're always working for our good in those ways. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Um, so, uh, get, we're not done. We're, we're not. Uh, we're not finished yet. yet. I want to ask, and I know we didn't plan this. I didn't run by by y'all. But I want to ask if Daniel and Anna Gant would come up for just a moment. I won't touch you. I promise. Keep my hands. Free. So y'all, many, most of y'all know that Daniel and Anna and Margaret and Sam are going to be moving to Tennessee this coming week, and um, we uh, we yeah I know. I know. Um, yeah, and so God, God has led you all here a couple years, two and a half years ago, God led y'all here, and y'all have been such a blessing to this community of faith, not only Farmville, I mean, you have been a blessing to Farmville, to the whole thing, but especially to our church, and so um, I know we didn't plan this, because I didn't want y'all to get to, you know, I didn't want that to happen earlier on, but I wanted to ask y'all to come up, and so um, I wanted to, to, for our benediction, to have a prayer over y'all for the next steps in your journey. Uh, to give thanks for the impact that you've made um, in, in our children's ministries, in, in our church family, in our worship here. Um, it, it's, been, uh, it's, it's been such a gift that y'all have given, and it's, it's who you are, and it's Christ dwelling in you doing that. And so um, if you would stand and join your hearts uh, in prayer with me uh, for Daniel and Anna and Margaret and Sam. Uh, God, we give you such thanks uh, for... Uh, this opportunity uh, today to be a blessing uh, to the Gants. God, we thank you for the ways that you have blessed uh, First Baptist Church and our family of faith through them, the ways that uh, they have worked behind the scenes, they have shared their lives, they have shared their children, um, and just, uh, just been a blessing to us all. Uh, we pray that today as, as we uh, end this time of worship and this last time with them being physically present with us here that we'll know that we are bound together. We have unity through your Holy Spirit. And as they go uh, back to Tennessee, we know they're going to be a blessing to the community of faith that they uh, go to and to their community. And uh, we pray that you would just, uh, just heap blessing after blessing upon them, keep them safe in their travels, and help all of those things uh, go easy and go well. Um, God, we give you thanks again today for this time of worship and for all the ways that you're working in all of our lives. Uh, God, give us all courage uh, to follow you and to, re to, to remember that when life is tough, we stand on the firm foundation because of Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. May you go in peace. Amen.